a space adventure to advance science and humanity, a journey of discovery to reach worlds unimaginable, previously unreachable. Ever wanted to build a space station with thousands of colonists whilst traversing the stars at faster than light travel? Well, now you can with Ixion. Today we take a deep dive into one of the most unique left field city builders coming out of the indie landscape. But the journey is not full of wonder and hope, as you might expect, but instead fraught with crisis, conspiracy and cataclysm at every turn. When everything goes wrong, will you find a home for the last of humanity, or die desperately, in vain, around some distant forgotten star? This is not your usual peaceful colony sim. This is Ixion, a year in review. Ixion is a game that really came out of nowhere and surprised this genre space with its interesting adaptations and stylistic influences from indie city builders before it. Released in December of 2022, Ixion was only the second major release from Bulwark Studios, a French independent games developer with only one other major title under their belt, 2018's Warhammer 40k Mechanicus, a turn-based tactic strategy game. The studio was bought out exclusively by majority shareholders Casido Games in 2021. This publisher has released a wide scope of indie games with a focus on strategy and resource management, such as Rise of Industry and Project High Rise. An interesting preview into what Bulwark would mold with their Ixion project. Working on the game over roughly three years with a shoestring budget and no more than 10 employees, Ixion brings to life the developers' inspirations from 1970s NASA studies on space habitation, particularly the Stanford Taurus design proposal. Combining this was a desire to explore sci-fi themes of space flight and space travel, and what that entailed with thousands of crew. Taking major influences from another left-field indie city builder with a lot of atmosphere and story-rich components, Ixion is heavily inspired by Frostpunk, with both games featuring a confined, almost claustrophobic city building loop, but adapting a similarly intense resource management system from games like the Anno series. Both Ixion and Frostpunk hallmark a compelling world building, told in a series of message sequences and dialogue that the player themselves must seek out and explore. Lauded for its imagery and atmosphere at launch, but criticized for its unforgiving difficulty and steep learning curve, Ixion has undergone several updates, but surprisingly no DLC for its year after launch. Because the game launched pretty much feature complete and hasn't received much content after release, we won't be considering the developer's post-release performance as a separate category. Regardless, in the rest of this video, we'll analyze the game's premise and its setting, its performance and graphical quality in its presentation as a low-budget indie game, its unique gameplay iteration on the city builder formula, and its core narrative as a single-mode story-driven space station sim. Ixion's setting and its story are intertwined. Indeed, the game has only one mode, without a freeform or sandbox mode, at least as of yet. That's quite surprising for a city builder. Essentially, Ixion is entirely a story-focused game. This is split into five chapters with a prologue that serves as a tutorial and introduction to the story arc. Ixion is set in the near future, precisely the year 2049. With the degradation of Earth's ecosystem and dwindling resources, humanity has begun looking to the stars as a means of escape. What's that quote? Mankind was born on Earth was never meant to die here. Yeah, it's a theme that's been repeatedly explored in many other games and mediums. So with that, in comes mega corporation Dolos, led by its charismatic and ambitious CEO, Vanir Dolos. With its boundless assemblage of resources, knowledge, wealth, and willpower, Dolos is in the process of testing its behemoth-sized space station, the Tycoon, a rotating wheel superstructure designed to generate artificial gravity for its potentially thousands of inhabitants. The Tycoon is equipped with a Vol engine, a technology that permits interstellar travel. 
However, during the testing of the Vol engine, a catastrophic failure results in the shattering of Earth's moon, an event known as the Lunaclism, that resultingly devastates all life on Earth. The malfunction critically damages the Tahakun itself and results in it staying put in the solar system but plunging forward an unknown amount of time into the future. This is where the player enters the picture, entrusted as the administrator of the entire space station, but in its crippled and dire condition. The administrator has complete control over all facets related to space station operation. Construction, resource allocation, accommodation, industry, power, law giving, etc etc and trusted to make the tough decisions to ensure the survival of the tycoon and its crew with earth now wiped out and humanity seemingly on the verge of extinction a contingency protocol activates directing the administrator to follow a new secret objective the search for humanity's new home on this quest the administrator will need to ensure the safety of the remnants of humanity living on board the tycoon whilst shepherding them to their new home the Tycoon is ultimately a finite vessel after all, and humanity will eventually need a new planet to inhabit. So research expeditions to distant worlds, colonization efforts on potentially habitable exoplanets, and even asteroid mining for the resources necessary to accomplish these tasks are all projects the administrator will have to perform. Each chapter of this story places the administrator and the Tycoon in a different star system, each system has its own explorable localities and their own challenges that will dictate operational feasibility and can even directly threaten the Tycoon and its crew. The position of planets, mineable resources, presence of stellar weather events and mission objectives are scattered across each system. Players have the freedom to just rush through objectives to get to the next chapter ASAP or methodically explore the entire system to extract every ounce of resource or scientific knowledge available. As the player progresses through the chapters and uncovers more and more of the plot, the challenge and resulting gameplay expands a great deal from just your average space station city builder. Sure, the player will have to feed their population, keep the power on, maintain the hull and steady the morale inside the station, but also face existential threats from outside the station. Space weather events, cosmological phenomenon, meeting new alien races, malfunctioning AI systems, even missile launches from rogue ships. A whole host of late game challenges that aren't necessarily obvious to players coming into the game just from seeing the promotional material alone. And that is why Ixion, I feel, is a sleeper of a game, poorly marketed and targeted to a niche crowd, but with a surprising complement of themes and subject material. Unfortunately, Ixion severely lacks in replayability because of its singular game mode. With a major post-release update introducing a difficulty menu where players can adjust the sliders on various parameters, Ixion is no longer a super frustrating experience and can be crafted to preference. This means that players can replay the game at a more challenging preset and there are multiple different endings to the story dependent on player choices but really these only diverge in the final chapter. Ixion is really a game that emphasizes not judging a book by its cover. Everything about it in the prologue and first chapter is something that seems tried and tested before in formula and scope. Earth is dying, save humanity. Here's a spaceship with very little room and resources. But it's a game that can constantly surprise, for better or for worse. Ixion presents itself as an engrossing, atmospheric portrayal of near-futuristic space travel. Beautifully rendered celestial bodies and game universe is complemented by a darker subsurface moralistic struggle, indicative of its tough decision making. There's three levels of display available to the player, a system view, external view and interior view. The system view shows a scaled planetary system map where the host star, orbiting planets, asteroids, and the Tycoon and its subships are displayed. This view can get pretty messy and I wish there were some sort of filters available to sort the information, such as hiding all the mineable resources and highlight visible planets better.
The exterior view is a fully 3D view of the Tycoon from an outside perspective, and this is the most beautiful view in the entire game. Not only a viewpoint to issue construction of the Tycoon's external systems such as solar panels, the external view features rendered space in real time. If the Tycoon is orbiting a planet, moving away from or approaching another celestial body, going through a debris field, traversing a stellar storm, or even visiting derelict spaceships, this is all showcased brilliantly in this scenic window. The exterior view also serves as a great UI function to see an overall station summary of the sectors, critical information in power consumption, population, stability, and workplace safety. And finally, we have the interior view inside the Tycoon. This is where the majority of the time is spent and where the main city building loop is played out. Here we can see influences from the Anno series, where it features a fully simulated resource and logistics system where goods are carried on roads between buildings and storage containers. But Ixion falls a bit flat when it tries to represent the individual person. The game's graphics serves as a functional representation of the numerical nature of the game. People are all sprites essentially, and so Ixion doesn't simulate things like foot traffic or working hours, like in Frostpunk, but more or less a visual portrayal of the population size, like in Anno. And so even though it copies UI features such as assigning individual names, like in Frostpunk, you can't click on them and follow their life through the station. It thus lacks the personal depth and charm Ixion is a sort of middle ground between Frostpunk and the Anno series. Indeed, the scale of the game is an intermediary between the dozens of refugees in the former and the tens of thousands of citizens in the latter. As a result, the focus is more or less entirely on the space station. And so, although you can physically travel to other worlds with the Tycoon, outside of some art and UI blips, there's very little interaction with other celestial bodies. It would have been cool to have an Anno style system where visiting and colonizing other planets or moons were fully rendered game spaces unto themselves, but I guess that is totally out of the scope of Ixion. Like the sound design in Frostpunk, Ixion utilizes audio as not only an atmospheric component, but a feedback tool for the player, and deft audio mixing creates an immersive background to exposition elements. The AIPA, or Artificially Intelligent Personal Assistant, is the player's trusty audio companion. Crises, emergencies, and announcements are blared to the player. Caution. Call integrity below 50%. Serving as both a narrative and notification tool, even with some elements of flavor. Happy New Year, Administrator. It can get a bit annoying though, especially when events occur in quick succession with no way to really tweak it. The Piranesi has activated more subsystems. Its threat level has increased. He will attack more frequently. There are a few paragraphs of voice acting as well, mostly limited to the prologue of the game. But what is there is very well written and makes me wish for more of it. Because the human cast is left on Earth while you and the Tycoon go on a separate journey, there should have been a cast that follows on your journey as well, maybe a command or admin team that helps to bind a narrative with some personal and human perspective. A tight-knit crew is one of the most prevailing themes of sci-fi, so I did feel a bit alone on my journey in Ixion. Music is an absolute standout, and for an indie project, one of the more surprising positives of Ixion. Produced by Guillaume David, who collaborated with Bulwark Studios on their previous title Warhammer 40k Mechanicus. Both soundtracks with their atmospheric techno-noir sci-fi themes resemble something coming out of Hans Zimmer's Dune, an all-round lovely element that elevates an already richly competent handle on the subject matter. The soundtrack is played in the background of this video. Ixion launched out of the gates with a few issues, but has since ironed most of it out, with performance highlighted as one of the crucial worked-upon issues by the devs post-launch. Ixion is a bit of a graphics card hog, but it does mean it is decently optimized with high utilization of GPU power. The game does tend to slow down and deteriorate as the station grows into the late game, but I mean, which city builder doesn't? It's still one of the best performing city builders thanks to its smaller scope and should be manageable on most systems. There are still a number of prevalent bugs present in the game, but nothing game breaking. 
Ixion is a pleasing example of decent game performance, which is not surprising for an indie release as they tend to not be overly bloated in optimization issues, but it trades off with lack of refinement in the presentation department. Because Ixion does showcase symptoms of its lower budget indie scope, the wonderful art is limited to piecemeal events and dilemmas. The wonderful voice acting is on display only at the beginning and the end of the game really, while scripted cutscenes are few and far between. There is a sense that Ixion shows barely enough of itself in order to sink players' teeth into, and could have been something more engrossing. Ixion brings to the table a new iteration on the survival city builder formula. Instead of sandbox, freedom, stressing creative flexibility, Ixion imposes conditional limitations that challenge the player to instead find creative solutions to a wide variety of problems that may arise. We'll first take a look at the basic gameplay loop involving the cycle of buildings and resources. At its core, Ixion has a pretty simple and self-explanatory city building process. Played on a grid format, buildings are plopped down and connected to a road network. Some buildings are restricted to being placed on the spaceship wall, and with each building having differing area footprints, this makes for quite a strategic Tetris-like challenge and plenty of opportunity to optimize and iterate. Because unlike many other city builders which stress almost unlimited space, players here are limited by the station's total floor area. There's three categories of resources, survival, raw and processed materials. Survival materials involve the critical functions of the space station. Power is first priority because without it, well, everything else won't run. Population would be considered the next critical resource. It's split into workers and non-workers. Each building requires a certain amount of workers to function optimally, and so players will have to delegate and transfer workers around the station to meet labor targets. Across the journey, players will have opportunities to find cryopods that can be opened. This is Ixion's main mechanic to increase the population. Food is needed to feed all that population, while science is needed to research new technologies. Raw materials, on the other hand, are encountered in the travels of the Tycoon through the star systems and often mined from asteroids. They are then processed into materials by industrial buildings, which are then consumed by the Tycoon's various systems. Raw iron, for instance, is smelted into alloy, the basic building material of the game. Carbon is transformed into polymer, which is used in solar panels and spaceships, while silicon is built into electronics, and it's consumed by higher tier buildings. The space station itself is split into six identical sectors. The first sector one is immediately available in the prologue, and the rest can be opened by the player after investing resources, whenever the player sees fit. Each sector is essentially its own self-contained city, with its own set of resources, population, and other parameters. Sectors do not really interact with each other. You can, however, transfer resources and population between them to alleviate deficiencies, almost like a in-house trade network. Sectors can also specialize if enough tiles within it are taken up by a category of buildings, which gives onus for players to strategize long term to maximize efficiency. Here's a look at a typical late game space station where I have a dedicated industry sector, a dedicated resource storage sector, a space and dockyard sector, a food production sector, and a pure population sector. Ixion features a pretty robust logistics system that harkens back to the Anno series. Stockpiles are like warehouses, but they can only be configured to store one particular resource. Transporter trucks then carry a unit of each resource at a time to wherever it is needed in the sector. So you can imagine that there's a real transportation conundrum if buildings don't receive resources quickly enough. So players have to plan buildings to be closer together, to reduce time wastage, whilst trying to snap them into the grid. This is where Ixion can get pretty complex, since sometimes it's not an issue of supply and demand, but rather an issue of logistical efficiency. The complexity jumps another caliber between sectors. Because of lack of space, it will result in the requirement to open up new sectors, and resources will need to be transferred between them. Ixion uses a transfer balance system that tries to maintain a target stockpile at each sector assigned. 
For instance, here at my food producing sector six, I've got a pretty large stockpile that transfers food to all the other sectors of the space station. The game will try to meet the home sector's set target number first before funneling excess to the other sectors. Now this is not instantaneous though, so transporter trucks will move the resources from the stockpiles to the other sectors via the gateway road connections, potentially taking a long time to reach far off destinations. Later research unlocks more trucks or eventually the use of drones that ignore road connections altogether and fly at rapid speeds to deliver resources. Logistics is thus the key that binds the bridge between buildings and resources, and the game's various mechanics and subsystems. How efficiently they perform is directly proportional to how efficient the transportation network is. It's very similar to the Anno series in that regard, if a bit more condensed. One of two main fail conditions in Ixion is the integrity of the Tycoon's hull. Constantly deteriorating due to wear and tear of operating in space, hull integrity contributes a crucial factor in maintaining morale with low levels eroding trust in the administrator. The hull is repaired by EVA airlocks, a wall-attached building which sends astronauts to constantly repair the hull by consuming alloys. The hull will always reach an equilibrium. Early game, it's quite easy to maintain maximum integrity with just one EVA airlock but eventually opening up more sectors and performing interstellar vol jumps to new systems permanently depletes the whole structure, requiring more EVA airlocks and more alloys to maintain integrity. Using the Tycoon's engines and various space weather events also cause a temporary increase in deterioration to the hull. I see pronounced similarities between maintaining the hull in Ixion and maintaining the generator in Frostpunk, Central mechanics to both games, the need to boost industry and mining to produce more alloys, commit more workers to repairing the hull, is indeed almost a mirror to the Frostpunk experience where the issue of heat is constantly driven by the need for more coal and more workers to extract it. As the station expands in Ixion, it puts more pressure on hull integrity. Likewise, as the population expands in Frostpunk, it requires more heat from the generator, increasing coal consumption. Hull failure and generator failure are mirrored as fail states of both games. Power is another critical resource and must be maintained at all times for operation and stability of the space station. From the early to mid game, power is entirely generated from external solar panels, which get progressively more expensive to build. There is a hard limit to the amount of solar panels that can be installed though, so late game power is supplemented by nuclear power plants that consume hydrogen, another mineable resource in stellar systems. Power balancing is constantly on a nice edge, as outages cause distrust from the crew, players will have to min-max consumption, such as turning off unnecessary buildings to save power. What's more, solar power is only generated when the Tycoon is orbiting a celestial body, so during stages of when the Tycoon needs to travel, batteries must be utilized to harness stored energy. Different tiers of batteries are eventually unlockable, which store more power. The Tycoon's entire crew is summarized as the population, which is split into workers and non-workers. Workers are necessary to keep all buildings functional. Each building requires its set amount of workers. Sectors that lack manpower suffer from less than optimal working conditions, ranging from extra hours to being overworked. This increases the chance of workplace accidents, which can cause delays, disruption, and potentially deaths. As a result, population is also a resource in itself that needs to be balanced among the sectors. Ensuring sufficient population to meet labor requirements whilst having enough accommodation, space and quality with the various housing buildings available are other factors that affect the administrator's trust level. And so players will spend a lot of time here at the population transfer screen, often meticulously balancing worker numbers. Population is therefore at a premium in this game. Like Frostpunk, there's no reliable on-demand way to grow the crew. Cryopods can be rescued or salvaged from all manner of encounters during the interstellar voyage. These represent humans that have gone into cryosleep as their own station or colony has failed, giving an opportunity to awaken them at the cryo center and increase the population of the tycoon. However, most cryopods are filled with non-workers, which essentially do not contribute anything to the space station besides being another mouth to feed. 
non-workers will eventually outnumber workers. I like to think of them as either children or the elderly or invalids or just non-labor entertainers or professionals that help to maintain the crew's morale but do not contribute to the critical functions of space engineering. Eventually, the player must consider colonization of planets as a long-term goal, and here colonists represent a third category of population. Trained from non-workers, these specialized crew are sent to outposts and potential habitation sites around the systems. To feed all this crew, we require food, and Ixion admittedly features a pretty simplistic food system compared to a lot of other city builders. Quite frankly, there's only a few food producing buildings. The most basic starter building is the insect farm, which employs workers without the need for any other inputs. To support larger populations, the modular crop farm will need to be set up, and these require significant amounts of water, melted from ice at fusion stations, which itself is mined from asteroids. Algae farms in the late game represent the most efficient food per water production method. The biggest challenge to food is actually the logistics of it. Food is consumed by the population in a strict regimen every five cycles, five days in game for all intents and purposes. Every sector needs to be stockpiled with adequate food for its population, so you can imagine the challenge of moving enough food from stockpiles to mess halls in that time frame. Let's just say there's a lot of tinkering and optimization to be done. As players try to maintain the aforementioned systems, they will be judged on their performance by the trust metric. Similar to Frostpunk, this is a constantly fluctuating parameter that is measured by the average stability of the Tycoon sectors. Sector stability is measured by a series of scores from the baseline zero, or neutral stability. A score in the negatives begins to erode overall administrator trust, whilst a positive score helps to increase trust. And so it's another balancing act. It's perfectly fine to have one or two unhappy sectors if you can prop it up with more stable sectors elsewhere. There's a whole array of different issues and events that affect stability. Most of these are triggered at certain points in the story, so we will go through these more in depth in the next chapter of the video. In general, the space station is quite stable at the beginning of the game, but narrative progression will slowly but surely deepen its volatility. And there are a few methods to maintain it. There are a few stability enhancing buildings that help to distract the crew, such as the alternative life center. Policies issued from the DLS center, such as propaganda or increased food rations, will greatly help to maintain stability. Whilst the player can trade productivity boost at the expense of a stability hit. For instance, you can prioritize opening up worker cryopods first. This will greatly help to fill the much needed labor pool, but comes at the cost of a negative three stability. One of the more interesting policies is waste disposal. Many buildings produce waste on this space station, but the default policy is to purge it into space. Stockpiling that waste and using it at the cost of stability can be useful for extra industry materials at the recycling center or for some extra food grown at the mushroom wall. Great ways to stretch otherwise limited resources. As we can see, much of the core gameplay is played within the space station in its interior, but there's a host of activities administrators can do outside the space station as well. With the docking bay, three different types of spaceships can be constructed. The science ship, where a crew of five travel to various celestial bodies in the system to study and gather the science resource. There's a mining ship to extract raw materials from asteroids and transport ships to ferry goods to and from the tycoon. Many celestial bodies in the stellar systems are hidden upon entering a new star system. The launching of satellite probes from the probe launcher and the detection minigame that comes with it facilitates the discovery of raw material deposits or places of interest worth visiting in the system. With the fleet management UI and the prioritization menu, administrators can connive a complex transportation web that harkens back to the Anno series. Finally, we have research. The tech lab opens up Ixion's tech tree, which unlocks new buildings and upgrades by investing the science resource. More advanced technologies are locked behind prerequisites in a tiered system that forces the player to think ahead long-term and plan out their tech tree progression. Eventually, you can combine technologies together to make some pretty broken combinations. 
For instance, you can build train stations, which makes transferring people around the sectors much quicker, whilst allowing certain stability modifiers to apply over the whole station. Using that second point, we can then build the Exo Fighting Dome, which gives a stability boost by plus two in that sector, but the bonus actually carries over to all the other sectors with train stations built, forever trivializing stability. There are small quality of life issues worth noting. For a game that places so much emphasis on building location and space efficiency, the lack of planning tools is quite frustrating. And also the fact that when deconstructing buildings, you have to wait for the refunded resources to be transported back to stockpiles exacerbates this issue. So if you made a small mistake in building placement, it takes forever to deconstruct and replace it because it's no move function. But this is all minor in comparison to Ixion's major flaw. Ixion subjects players to a punishing negative feedback loop. Events that happen out of the player's control, such as workplace accidents, can cause downward spirals that can lead to deaths, which causes manpower shortages, and can spiral even further. It's a fairly realistic portrayal of Murphy's Law and how anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And so Ixion is a great chaos simulator with its emergent crises, but stripping player agency with what are essentially RNG elements can rub certain players the wrong way. Furthermore, when the stakes get higher and the going gets tougher, it can descend into a chaotic management nightmare. Ixion's external view, though beautiful, also lacks any real meaningful gameplay functionality, besides a pretty screen to click buttons on. Deploying solar panels and installing story-related external systems of the Tycoon is surprisingly simplistic compared to the rest of the internal gameplay. If hull repairs were localized and solar panel locations mattered, this could be a cool screen to feature another separate building loop. And it's one general overarching theme in Ixion, we actually don't get to interact too much with the Tycoon superstructure, which would have been cool, but I guess that's outside the scope of the game. Ixion juggles a lot of different mechanics, perhaps too many, and it seems that developers have not really thought through what this results to the end user. Quite deep in its gameplay, but quite muddy in the tools available for players to conquer this depth. Ixion results in an unforgiving learning curve and difficulty plunge that will see restarts and save scumming aplenty. It can be micromanagement heavy and mathematically exhausting, but Ixion does have that rare tendency to scratch that unique city builder itch of striving for perfection, equilibrium, and hyper efficiency. Because of Ixion's style in only having a singular story mode, one in which the richness of the story and complexity of gameplay are intertwined, any analysis of the narrative and its impact naturally leaves us treading into the territory of spoilers, but we have taken due care to minimize wherever necessary. In this first initial testing phase of the Tycoon, the game's prologue is set in 2049, which also serves as the game's tutorial, the administrator must oversee basic construction of the Tycoon's internal necessities before performing humanity's first interstellar jump to the nearest star Proxima Centauri, a brief respite for scientific and engineering diagnosis, before returning back to Earth, hopefully in one piece. While the construction is ongoing, the Tycoon can explore the solar system, visiting the planets and conducting research for science. In fact, I encourage all players to do this, as slightly beyond the orbit of Saturn, there lies an unknown point of interest, one of the foreboding elements that begins to unravel the conspiracies of the story. This secret space station, the Outer Hope, is forbidden from outside contact, as it turns out. It is a hidden dolos operation researching and developing the next iteration of the Tycoon, the Protagoras, a sister ship that perhaps intends to have more ambitious objectives than its predecessor. After all, the Tycoon is designed to just be a test vessel for the Vol engine. And so with everything squared away in the prologue, it's time to launch the Tycoon to Proxima Centauri, hailing in a new era of human space exploration. However, things turn out catastrophically bad, with the Tycoon seemingly sundering Earth's moon. 
The tycoon and the administrator jump forward in time, not to Proxima Centauri as intended, but into an apparent advanced state of the home solar system, with Earth seemingly uninhabitable. Critically, the tycoon was heavily damaged after that first jump, and so Ixion throws players almost immediately into a dramatic situation, setting up the grim survival tone for the rest of the game. A redundancy plan activates with the onboard AI, a new mission objective established for the tycoon. Ensure humanity's survival by finding a habitable exoplanet. Beginning with this chapter is where Ixion starts to throw morally ambiguous dilemmas to the player deliberating with the crew about what exactly just transpired, and wrestling with the fact that the Tycoon and its constituents are maybe what remains of humanity. In this depressing state of realization, the administrator must inspire the crew, fix the Tycoon, and seek out a path forward. Eventually, the player will learn about a struggle between the United Nations and Dolos, a hidden facility around the orbit of Jupiter used to construct the Protagoras, a new iteration of the Vol engine called Ixion, and the discovery of the apparently habitable exoplanet called Remus. With nothing but crumbs of information, the Tycoon will have to perform a jump to the last known coordinates of the Protagoras by docking with the Jupiter facility and installing the prototype Ixion engine. With so much initial hope destroyed, the situation is eventually salvaged. The Tycoon can now chase its destiny. Ensure humanity's survival by finding the habitable exoplanet named Remus. The second jump brings the Tycoon into the Immortan system, where a large icy mist cloud covers much of the area around the star. It is revealed by the onboard AI that each jump causes irreversible damage to the Tycoon structure. As a result, the threshold of whole integrity gets reduced every chapter, compounding the difficulty. Here, the Tycoon finds the Protagoras entrenched in the ice field around the star Immortan, and learns that it was hunted down and attacked by a United Nations ship called the Etamananki. Resultingly, the Protagoras is severely damaged with evidence of conflict, rampant looting, and strings of dead corpses painting a grim picture of the outcome of the Tycoon's sister ship. What's more, the information on Remus has been stolen by the Etamananki, with which the UN ship is presumed to have traveled to, and so the Tycoon must follow the UN ship's coordinates. But to do that, the Tycoon has to dock with the Protagoras to mine its sister from its icy prison and retrieve the data all while placing the Tycoon under due stress from the hostile environment, piling on the difficulty even further. It is eventually revealed that hundreds of crew are still remaining inside of it, surviving in two sectors, and that the Tycoon must decide to save or abandon the remnants of the Protagoras. Arriving in clearly what is not the exoplanet Remus, the Tycoon finds the destroyed remains of the supership Etamananki and must uncover what has transpired, all while floating corpses mortifies the Tycoon crew. The Etamananki was conceived by the UN as a desperate last measure to save humanity, built much larger than the Tycoon but haphazardly. Further investigation reveals it was ambushed and attacked by another ship, this time a seemingly rogue vessel called the Piranesi. The rest of this chapter sees the studying of the weapon system used to destroy the Etamananki and the development of countermeasures to prepare for what seems to be an inevitable showdown with the Piranesi. All this occurs in the Theta Crucis system, a star shrouded in a giant electromagnetic storm that causes immense damage to the Tycoon and its spaceships. This storm slowly advances around the system and will annihilate all space vessels it makes contact with, a frustrating revelation that is not indicated clearly enough to the player and one of the hallmarks of Ixion's punishing difficulty. Caution. Entering stellar storm. Chasing the Piranesi into a system surrounding a dormant pulsar, the Tycoon finds the rogue ship inactive and must extract the coordinates for Remus to continue its mission. Unexpectedly, or maybe expectedly, nothing goes to plan once again as the Piranesi awakens, powered by a rogue AI that launches a drone swarm onto the Tycoon. Ah, I 
see you. Playing cat and mouse around the system, the Tycoon must evade the Pyrenees' various attacks, including missile launches that cause destruction to the hull and interior, and cyber attacks that cripple buildings and corrupt the onboard PA. Piranesi has disabled several missiles. All the meanwhile trying to figure out a solution to deal with the threat. This is one of the most chaotic mission sequences I've ever played in any game. Imagine trying to play a fast paced version of battleships, with the game board getting smaller and smaller every turn, and the enemy ship gets to use a wide range of weaponry, whilst juggling a city builder space station side game on ultra difficulty. Yeah, it's a doozy, but it sets up for a pretty satisfying and creative finale. The fifth and final chapter sees the Tycoon jump to its intended target system, the Elia Star, which hosts a variety of rocky exoplanets. On the verge of structural breakdown due to all of its previous debilitating vol jumps, the administrator must seek out Remus and begin the colonization procedures. But of course, things aren't as they seem again. And not to spoil too much again, but encounters with alien races, a re-encounter with the Pyrenesi, the revelation of a huge conspiracy of Dolos and a second habitable planet called Romulus, Chapter 5 concludes an immensely dramatic narrative and can result in different outcomes dependent on player choices throughout the chapters. Irrespective of the main story arc of various side missions the administrator can choose to follow, one such is the colonization test program to find other planets as potential alternatives to Remus. Chapter 2 features the first discovery of a potentially habitable exoplanet in the Immortan system, and the player can choose to launch a colonization expedition to assess feasibility. This continues into Chapter 3, where the discovery of trace oxygen and microbial life on an exoplanet presents another promising candidate. Furthermore, there is an entire story chain about the use of a backdoor algorithm to force decisions that are unauthorized or deemed prohibitive to the success of the Tycoon's mission. The activation of the Naomi Protocol allows the player to override the intended story arc and reveal extra story content that would be otherwise hidden in a normal or true playthrough. In fact, the decision to illegally visit Outer Hope Station in the prologue is locked behind a Naomi Protocol decision. It's up to the player to go against Dolos Protocol or not. Activating the Naomi Protocol in certain mission sequences allows for strange outcomes in side missions, like authorizing a humanoid test subject to return to the Tycoon after it just killed five of your science ship crew. In another mission, you can choose to repatriate a cryopod saved dog. Overriding quarantine procedures and allowing it to roam free provides a permanent stability bonus for the Tycoon crew. These type of events definitely remind me of Frostpunk. The outcomes are often very ambiguous, but I don't feel a dramatic game-changing weight to them as I would in that game. Across the journey, various other requests and events will unfold that are dependent on the situation of the space station. Food scarcity and constant hunger forces the crew to demand improvements to food production. When eating purely insects begins to wear on the crew, they will demand more variety in their diets. But perhaps they don't enjoy mushrooms produced from their own waste too much. The issue of saving humanity is another ever-present theme in Ixion. With the crew's desperation to see loved ones and the gameplay need for more labor, naturally, cryonic pods will need to be opened. But I love how the game generates this sense of altruism, which convinces the players that, despite the challenge of accommodating more and more crew, it seems imperative to try to save as many humans as possible. Choosing to save the crew of the Doom Protagoras is one such example. Of course, these dilemmas can always be denied, but it builds the crew's distrust with the administrator that can potentially have devastating effects to stability. Furthermore, morale is constantly degrading as the journey wears on. A psychological illness deemed dead earth sickness begins showing up immediately after the events in chapter one, triggered by the fact that earth is no more and causing a permanent stability penalty for the rest of the game. 
This exacerbates, leaving the solar system in chapter 2, convinces the crew that they will never again see the stars that saw them born, accentuating dead of sickness even further. Learning about the fate of the Protagoras is another minus one to stability. The concerning results of failed colonization tests further degrade morale. The conflict with the Pyrenees is a punishing penalty on what is already a difficult mission. Even staying in a system too long will impact crew perception of the performance of the administrator. Suffice to say, the player must constantly figure out solutions to counterbalance this. Often there are limited textual clues highlighted that suggest the possible outcomes of decisions. For instance, integrity sensors from spaceship crew indicating necessary repatriation can be discerned from the event dialogue. Continuing on with the investigation will lead to the loss of the crew. Other times, choosing the right decisions can lead to positive boons for the tycoon, such as unlocking new technologies through astute scientific choices. The choices in Ixion, however, do not carry the same emotional weight as compared to a game like Frostpunk. And there's a feeling that if a player is not interested in sci-fi themes, then many of these decisions can lack any moral quandary. Some events are not expanded clearly enough or are not impactful enough to provide meaningful effects, such as the aspect of religion. A cult can begin to spread, but really has no impact on the overall gameplay. Furthermore, some of the later chapters really accelerates with its pacing. Everything is on a timer and there's no sense of downtime or relaxation to slow play and take a breather. The progressive difficulty curve is also unrelenting and applies no breaks on the player's ability to absorb story content. This type of high stakes climax I feel is completely the antithesis to a city builder experience because it lacks the punch of a satisfying ending. I would have appreciated a bit more personality from the crew as well. Over the Ixion experience, I struggled to imagine the people on the Tycoon as nothing more than a bunch of numbers and took far more inspiration in the more encompassing concepts of saving humanity as a whole, which lessened the impact and emotional resonance of individual deaths. Much of the writing presented in the event and mission panels were very well written, and it's clear this comes from a background of writers that enjoy sci-fi, that like to explore strange and esoteric themes, but it can be tedious to sift through all the relatively disconnected exposition. The lack of replayability due to one game mode means that mileage will ultimately vary for a lot of players. Myself personally, playing through slowly and methodically, it took me a total of about 40 hours to complete the game with an alternate ending. Finally, there is a sense the narrative ending itself was just a bit lackluster and did not respect the player's entire efforts over those 40 hours. I guess it just wasn't gratifying enough of a conclusion. What Ixion does well is that it merges the direction of the game with the idealism of the player, especially if you are in tune with the virtues of space exploration. As an administrator of what is essentially a critically endangered species, you want to find ways to save humanity, despite all the perils and challenges that await. You want to open up every cryopod, no matter worker or non-worker, you want to ensure as minimal deaths occur as possible by choosing the most altruistic of paths. Maybe not entirely for the good of humanity, but at least for the player ego in accomplishing shrewd strategy and micromanagement. Although most written concepts in Ixion are often too complex for the average gamer, it nonetheless explores many imaginative encounters not often considered in a sci-fi space station building sim. And that's down to the wonderful writing and bleak, somber take on the sci-fi spacefaring genre. Simple in its premise, but wide in its execution, Ixion is an enigma of a city builder that does what it's supposed to do on the box, but expands into something special the more you dive through it. Although lacking in replayability, Ixion's own iteration in the city builder formula combined with its nifty narrative structure is enough for a solid singular experience, 7 out of 10. Originating from the indie playbook, but delivering more than expected, Ixion's pleasing graphics and amazing soundtrack garners a great atmospheric title with a lot of sci-fi imagery, all on a low budget. Furthermore, at launch, it was pretty much feature complete with very little performance issues besides optimization. 
8 out of 10. Mechanically rich and expressive in its systems, Ixion is a city builder that is heavily inspired by many other titles but does end up shining on its own. Ixion's main weakness though is its inability to reconcile with its sense of depth and its progressively increasing challenges, presenting a niche experience that is almost too much to handle for casual crowds. 8 out of 10. At its core, Ixion is a story-driven game with a mishmash of different sci-fi topics that will interest those willing to read through exposition. Despite that, the narrative can outrun the player later on, not giving enough respite for immersion, and not culminating into enough of a satisfying conclusion. The abstract themes are unique, but often not emotionally resonant for a game centered around human survival. 5 out of 10. Ixion achieves a final rating of 7 out of 10. A strong release from indie studios Bulwark Games. Ixion is priced at 35 US dollars. At this price range, it's a pretty solid recommendation for what it offers. But depending on the player, this is our verdict. Recommended for those who are after a challenging but unique, somewhat esoteric story driven city builder, look no further. It's a small niche, but it will scratch the itch like no other. I see a lot of overlap with Frostpunk's crowd that can potentially enjoy this game as both titles sort of share the same scope and formula, so consider this on sale. Chases of hyper-efficiency in games such as Factorio or Oxygen Not Included and the Anno series may have some mileage here if they don't mind all the extra narrative dressing on top. If you've enjoyed the Expanse TV series, no, seriously, if you like the lore of that show, Ixion offers lots of political world building, government conspiracies, and planetary conflict. Ixion's lack of freeform play, chaptered game mode, and progressive challenge will struggle to appeal to those after a peaceful city building experience. And while its spacefaring survival premise may pique the interest from colony sim enthusiasts, it really falls apart as being a procedural story generator, unlike Rimworld or Door Fortress. Ixion can be something special for a certain type of player. Ixion treads this weird line between being too hard of a game for sci-fi fans appreciative of its premise and narrative, but too lacking in features and longevity to attract the general city builder crowd. Instead, it should be seen from the lens of an indie game project, a short, albeit enigmatic, but potentially delightful sci-fi adventure. Regardless, we'll be keeping a close eye on developers Bulwark Studios for the future. This was Ixion, a year in review. If you've enjoyed this review, be sure to subscribe for more analytical videos on similar games like this one. And if you want to support the channel further, consider subscribing on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month.